Good evening from Plugkit Studios in Largo, Florida. I'm Scott. I'm Abram. And we are here with episode 538 of F5 Live, refreshing technology for Sunday, September 15th, 2019. This show is a proud part of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. This week, Uber is fighting off pressure, EA is testing under stress, and Voodoo is hiding from bad words. Wherever you are and however you're accessing our show, whether it be on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, on uh, any of our live, what? live stream platforms, livestream.com, uh, Periscope, Mixer, Twitch, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, on any of the podcatchers, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the Podcast Play app, the myriad of others, uh, including Spotify or TuneIn, or of course on our website, plugkidslive.com. Thank you for making us a part of your day. There are two ways that you can do that. The first is on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, you can go to f5live.tv slash join us, and there you can chat with us in the studio and uh, watch the show all in one place. Uh, um, what We love to hear what you have to say about the topics as we talk about them. Uh, so definitely if you're able to join us, we'd love to see that. If you're not able to join us, that is okay. Plughitslive.com slash subscribe, and you will see all of our shows, including F5 Live and The Pilch Point, plus... Uh, Plug Hits Live Presents, First Looks, and a whole bunch more are all there for you. Uh, I think that's the spiel. So, Avram, how have you been? All right. Not uh, not bad. You know, long, long week. Uh, but uh, I can't believe it's Sunday already. Right? I need another day or two. Boy, this weekend uh, just kind of disappeared on me, too. <laughs> So yeah, I don't know where the time went. I really don't. Could you? I could use another day. I really could. Me too. Maybe it's a day to sleep. Um. Anyway, just a little bit of that would be nice. <sighs> yeah. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Well. Well, on the bright side, it's plugged in, so I don't think I can bring it over here. But I got my Picade arcade machine mostly working okay uh now except for the fact that three buttons on it don't work and i can't figure out why but the software is is working my son and i were playing um arcade games on it before and atari games on it uh so um so pretty pretty decent is the software working because you did something or is the software working because there's an official build for your hardware now Mm, okay, so the question is, <laughs> so if you've been following this story, and it's relevant to those who want to do uh, arcade emulation, which is fun, uh, if you have a Raspberry Pi 4 uh, you and you wanted to do arcade emulation, you would know that the major emulation platforms, uh, which are RetroPie and Recallbox and Laka, but mainly RetroPie is the big one, uh, do not support it officially. Uh, and there have been workarounds, which I published an article on, on, on Tom's hardware a couple weeks ago. Uh, but those workarounds had a little bit, had some big compromises to it. For example, it had to run on top of X windows, the window part of the operating system. So that really slowed it down. Oh. Plus it caused extra heat. Uh, so I found instructions from somebody, uh, on how to install it. Uh, using what's called the FKMS driver, which I guess is the new graphics driver that Raspberry Pi 4 needs. And that's also not official, uh, but it works. So I'll update my article. It works, and you don't have to, and it doesn't boot to Windows. So boot into the X Windows first. So, um, so we're still waiting for the final build, but this is definitely putting us in a much better a uh, better position you really can you really can use it the issue with the buttons i don't think actually is uh, retro pie's fault i think it may be an issue with uh my picade uh with my picade hardware but um i'm trying going back and forth with the people who make the picade to see if, if there's a fix or if there's just something wrong with my hardware so um anyway uh but yeah so so you know there's more 
promising stuff for for doing emulation. Of course, if you had an old Ras an old, if you had a Raspberry Pi three, you wouldn't have these problems right. and could run all the same stuff. Um, so, you know, but of course, I want it. You, I want to have the latest and greatest. And the, and the good news is now you can finally get a Raspberry Pi four with four gigabytes, whereas previously those were really hard to come by. They were sold out in a lot of places now. Uh, they have them at Micro Center. They have them at a site called Vilros.com. Um, so there are definitely a, a number of places where you can get it. That's and now you can game on it. I was going to say that it's great that they're that the the big ones available again, and it's even better <laughs> that we're getting closer to a hundred percent official support on uh, <laughs> on all the hardware. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it's closer. Yeah. It, to to the point where you don't have to run it in the windowed version. So that's, I mean, that yeah. by itself is a huge move forward. Yeah, yeah. Because that was really killing it. It was giving me the overheating message all the time. So That's right. I remember you mentioning that. And it's not doing that anymore. Yeah, although I don't know. Maybe it just can't give you the overheating message when you're not in the, when you don't have the windows running. Fascinating. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I actually don't know. I should know that, but I don't know. Because in <laughs> Raspberry Pi, unlike in Windows and other operating systems that I'm aware of, if your computer start, if the CPU starts to overheat, you get a little thermometer icon that just automatically appears in the upper right corner of the screen to tell you that. Okay. Whereas I don't think there, I don't think you get that in, I don't think you get that in Windows or Mac or most flavors of Linux. No, I think you do on the on iOS though. I know it. I know when it gets really bad, uh, and the phone turns off because it's too hot. It shows you a thermometer. Nah, <laughs> mine does that a lot. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, it's it's not the best piece of hardware I've had, but <laughs> but yeah, I I could absolutely see that being not part of the firmware, but part of the the windowed UI. So that's possible that that. That it's still doing it. You're just not able to get the message about it. Yeah, it's possible. It's quite possible. Okay. Well, hopefully <laughs> that's not the case. And uh, this has made yeah. it calm down enough that it's just not overheating anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, well, on my side, it's been an interesting week. Uh, we started trying something today for those of you who follow us on either Mixer or Twitch. Uh, we have actually had uh, a live stream running all day, uh, running interviews from some of our Plug Hits Live Presents uh, events in the past. Uh, CES 2019, Collision 2018, uh, some Collision 2019. Uh, so just some of our, some of our favorite interviews uh, running over there. And uh, there's been some, some interaction from you guys. So uh, we definitely appreciate that. It's been, it's been fun to do. And uh, I think we're going to make that a weekend thing. Uh, Saturdays and Sundays leading up to uh, F5 Live, we'll run old stuff, and then after the show, we'll go back dark and see what happens. But it's been a lot of fun uh, watching some of the old interviews that I haven't seen in a while. You know, stuff from Collision 2018 that I just haven't thought about in a year and a half. <laughs> it's been it's been fun to revisit some of that stuff. Uh, and then we've got we've got uh, Roboticon coming up. In one month, we will be doing Roboticon, which means first looks will be happening on Saturday, and F5 Live will not be happening on Sunday, so it's important to, to remember that. Um, but we will definitely uh, have a lot of live content, because we will be streaming the entire event. So uh, definitely you'll want to check that out as well. Uh, I think that's it for housekeeping for right now, so how about we get down to some news? This week's Nifty Gifties and F5 Live is proudly powered by the Microsoft Store. Whether you're looking for a new laptop or tablet, uh, a, an Xbox One, either S or X, you're looking to purchase the new Gears 5 or a host of other products, you can get them all from the Microsoft Store, including saving up to $300 on the Surface Pro 6 if uh, 
if a good deal is what you're looking for, right now is the time to do it uh, because with uh, all of the with the the Surface event at the beginning of next month, Microsoft is making way for those new products now with some really great deals. Uh, and you can find all of those deals and all of those products by going to f5live.tv slash Microsoft. Um, so everybody knows the name Uber and uh, it, they're kind of the name when you think of both uh, ride sharing and gig economy. Um, they, they certainly brought the idea of the gig economy to the, uh, to the forefront and created this whole generation of, of apps and platforms that allow you either in your spare time or for some people as your full-time job to make uh, pretty decent money. However, what not everybody knows about Uber is that uh, they have never made a profit. <laughs> in fact, they lose a ton of money. Every quarter, they lose more money than you as a human being can comprehend. Over the last year or so, in fact, every quarter since they uh, went public, uh, which is when we started to learn numbers, uh, they have lost, on average, a billion dollars. Yep, you heard that correctly. With a B, one billion dollars. Uh, this quarter... They lost, they reported a loss of $5 billion. Now, a lot of that is because of um, the IPO itself, uh, one-time costs involved in that, but still not great to, uh, to be shedding that much money that quickly. And so this year has been an interesting one for them. In uh, July... Yes, in July, they laid off 400 people from their marketing department, and this week, they laid off another 435 from their uh, engineering and product departments. So, that's a lot of people, uh, and while, obviously, 835 people is, uh, is a high number, it represents only 3% of, uh, of their employees, which that's a lot of employees for a company. Uh, but anyway, um, obviously they're trying to find money, right? They're trying to, <laughs> they're trying to make money. Uh, all of the unicorns have, have had this kind of a problem though, right? We've seen, we've seen Facebook and Instagram and, you know, all, all the companies who were valued very high before they made any money all had the problem of hiring a lot of people in a lot of places and not quite uh, having an environment to make things work <laughs> uh, because they were just having investment money thrown at them. Uh, they all make bad decisions. And this here, and... and uh, Uber even said it. This here is kind of a bit of a correction to that. They're they're trying to find efficiencies and having people all over the world in offices doing the same thing didn't make sense. And so they're they're correcting it and I think I think that was inevitable, don't you? Uh, I guess so. I mean, I don't know why they need this many people. Mm. Uh, I'm with you on that. What, what are they all doing? It says 27,000 full-time employees. Isn't that crazy? So. And that doesn't count. I don't know. How many? That doesn't count like software contractors and stuff who don't work for the company, but work with the company. Or drivers. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or it drivers. doesn't count drivers at all. Tw right. So. 27,000 full-time employees. It's simply not that complex of a system to try. I mean, I understand they've probably got a lot of marketing. They've got a lot of sales. But, woof. Why? Why do they have a lot of sales? Because they've got other... They're not selling it. I, uh, they've got other things other than the, uh, the ride-sharing platform. They've got Uber Eats, so they've got people out there literally trying to sell to restaurants. Um, I've, I've okay, actually so that, been... That I've thing. been in a restaurant while an Uber Eats salesperson was there. That was a fascinating conversation. <laughs> Right. Okay. So that's 
something. Yeah. Um, they've got where they would need people locally. Yeah, they've also got freight, uh, which is its own kind of weird di- division. In some parts of the world, they've got um, like a an actual delivery courier type service. Um, so you know, there's there's definitely local sales type stuff that has to happen in a lot of markets. So I can I can see having a strangely high sales team. Yeah, I mean, how many of those people are taking complaints about crazy drivers? Yeah, like how many people do they have to do they have to have for that? True. So there you go. There's um, support people. And and they do do don't they now do some minimal level of background check on people who sign up? Yes. They do the amount of background Although, check that they claimed they always did. <laughs> right. Although, although let's keep in mind that they probably don't actually conduct the background check. They probably right. just pay a background check company to do it. So that's probably not full time. I mean, someone has to to filter those applications, though. So I guess that's, you know, that's a department right there, you know. Um, but nevertheless, I thought, you know, I mean... And then they're laying off engineers. How how much engineering do they have to do? Well, like the, the app is built. The here's the thing that surprised me: the 435 engineering slash product uh, positions that were eliminated this week represent only eight percent of the engineering slash product workforce. Okay, so. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to this. Perhaps you do, but how many people work on micro? How many, by engineer, I assume they mean like programmers and yeah. people who assist in the development of their software. For for how all of their work on for all of their platforms, and keep in mind that one of their one of their engineering platforms is self driving cars. So that's that they do have an in house self driving car team. So that's important to remember. But anyway, yes. Continue your question. What's the size of the house? If it's in house, it's crazy. Well, it's a very big thousand people. It's the size, but yeah, it's a very big house. It's a very big house. I mean, I just think about Microsoft. I remember they once. I remember once seeing a picture of like everybody who worked on my on like Windows ten, or Windows seven or something, and it couldn't have been more than like a hundred people. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe that maybe that's. Maybe that wasn't an accurate picture. I really, I really don't know. I mean, obviously, if you count beta testing and all that other stuff, but like people who actually put hand to keyboard to write code for Windows, I don't think it's like thousands of people. I think it's like scores or hundred scores or a couple hundred people maybe who are producing major major applications like that. So as a full time job, so you're saying that Uber needs more people to maintain their apps than like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken about how many people work on Windows. I don't know. Windows has an active development team of about 2,000 and a full uh, team roster of about 6,000. But remember, an operating system versus a person delivery app on scale are right. I mean, very different. I'm trying to give that example of, because like Windows is the world's most co- popular operating system mm-hmm. or at least for the desktop and like that should have the most people working on it of anything because it's an entire operating system. Uh-huh. Right? Yep. So so you're saying that Uber needs more people than that. That is, uh, or something like that. Right. That is what Uber is saying for sure, uh, because if 435 yeah. represents eight percent of the engineering department, that means that the engineering department before the layoffs was somewhere in the five thousand range. For the engineering yeah. and product team, that does I imagine that yes. does not include things like project managers, testers, UI. Um, so it might, but it probably doesn't include all of those people. So it could be more than the 5,000. So the Uber is saying that it takes as many people to work on 
on Uber as it does to produce Windows. <laughs> With, yeah, I'm, it's crazy. Every time I hear how many people are at Facebook, I'm like, what? <laughs> how? <laughs> how do they stay organized? How, how do they how do they find things to do? <laughs> Man. How many people did it take to build the only real new product out of Facebook in the last couple of years? And that's Facebook dating. Uh, I know somebody who put together a dating app with three people in about six months. <laughs> here's the here's the irony of this. I bet you that it's easier to put together a major product with three people than it is with 3000 people. Yes, significantly. The more I mean, that's the that's more project the managers have too many cooks. Yeah. The more project managers you have to have involved, um, the the more chaotic it gets and the harder it is to get anything done. Yeah. But uh, financial woes are uh, are only starting for the company, unfortunately, because this week, California passed an interesting law or. We'll say passed. Uh, it still has to be signed by the governor, but the governor is expected to sign it. So let's say they passed, certainly through both chambers of houses, um, a new law that will require uh, companies such as gig economy companies to treat their uh, essential independent contractors as uh, full-time employees, which means... The, right. So, OK, so the thing that makes the gig, the gig economy interesting, possible and um, and scalable is the fact that uh, there's if you wanted to drive for Uber, nobody is telling you you have to work from nine to five or three to ten or nobody's giving you a schedule. Nobody is saying you must take a certain number of drivers per hour. Nobody is saying that if you're if you're running slow, uh, you can't be a driver anymore. All because you are paid per task, not per hour. But this law will essentially guarantee uh, an Uber driver minimum wage. Uh, will require Uber and Lyft and companies like Postmates and TaskRabbit um, who all have essential uh, independent contractors as part of their business model. They'll, they'll have to uh, offer unemployment and all of that stuff, which means the end of the gig economy because there's no way, there's no way Uber being forced to pay minimum wage uh, says, uh, you, you accept the rides that you want to. <laughs> no way that that happens anymore. So all, because they're already losing money on their business model as it is. They're looking for ways to save money. This isn't going to get them there. Well, the irony of that is they're, uh, when we talk about them losing money is they're not even investing the money in investing the money in, in the stuff the product actually does, right? They're not paying for gasoline. They're not mm -hmm. paying for cars. They're not paying for insurance, right? right? Uh, and, and they're not paying for the health insurance or you know other benefits for these, these employees. So I guess it really depends on how you view the gig economy and who's doing who's participating in it mm -hmm. right if someone is doing it as a part-time job hey i want to earn some extra money doing uber or i'm doing a whole bunch of different part-time jobs and that's how i stitch together my my living sure like an uber is a part of it but then i'm also being a some other type of profession uh you know on the side maybe i'm a freelance writer and i do uber and i do mm -hmm. you know uh, and and maybe rabbit and all these different and, things. And maybe you're a free and the first two are a good pairing. Maybe you're a freelance writer who carries a laptop with you and when you're sitting in a parking lot waiting for a for a ride to come in, maybe you're writing. Maybe you're you're dual taking advantage of the same amount of the same time period. 
Right. Yeah. But the thing is, there also are a lot of people and that this is their full-time job. Uh, and they've had to take a full-time job like this because the limousine company that used to employ them has been put out of business by Uber because Uber is so much more convenient um, to use and Uber is usually cheaper. Um, so on the one hand, Uber is much, much more convenient. It's not necessarily convenient because, I mean, I guess part of the convenience is that there's so many people doing it, which there would not be if they were full, if they were full-time employees, because right. then they would say, well, we don't need to have yep. all these people circling around all the time. We can't pay for them to circle around. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so forget it. Um, but what, these sorts of laws are also trying to do is stop companies who, you know, are essentially employing somebody full time. And, and like, we've all worked for companies like this. I mean, I, I have where you have an employee who, oh, okay, actually they're really your employee. You're paying them. They're working like, you know, 40 hours a week for you. Maybe they're even in the office with you, but the company didn't want to create, create a full time position because, you know, because mm -hmm. they, um, you know, now my current company doesn't do this because they're very, they're very conscious of this sort of thing. Right. But I've been with, I've been with companies that, yeah, that, that are not conscious about it and they don't want to give bene benefits to somebody. So, so, you know, they would rather to pay somebody just freelance, mm -hmm. um, yeah, freelance money and that, that avoids them paying you know, pay, paying for benefits sure. for the person that normally you would expect an employer to pay. So I think you got to see both, both sides of this issue. If someone is really acting like an employee um, and doing this as a full-time job, then maybe, then maybe, you know, the company should not be enabled because basically they're enabled an unfair advantage over companies that are treating people as full-time employees. True. If I run a limousine company and I have 10 full-time employees uh, and I'm paying them like full-time employees, uh, I'm at a disadvantage uh, against Uber who only has to pay people when there's business. Maybe for business for business they complete. Maybe uh, uh, because with with the limousine company, uh, you know, maybe maybe the amount that they make on ten rides is way more. You know, the the percentage is, might be higher, and it's not like they're paying the the drivers differently. Yeah, you know, the the drivers with maybe. Uber essentially make a commission to make their to make a ride versus yeah. getting paid a flat thing. So I mean, there's. Yeah. There's a possibility that that you know the ta the what the limo company might come out ahead um, financially. It, the, yeah, I mean to be honest, it's I all don't condition. really know the economics of of how limo companies work. I mean, maybe they're not really paying people full time either. Um, so I mean, it affects them too, right? Sure. So I, I see I see the the point here that like it's creating a it's creating a regulatory situation for people who just want to do. And companies that just want to provide like here's a little extra cash mm -hmm. but when it comes to the situation where the fact that there are all these people who can do this here's a little extra cash job are adding up to hey there's actually fewer fewer full-time jobs because there's all of this labor available to do this stuff but then these people can't then these people can't pay for essential essential benefits which then, by the way, end up getting paid for by taxpayers very often in the form of like Medicaid and other social services. Sure. Because the companies aren't because the companies are using gig economy jobs to avoid paying benefits, then the taxpayer has to pay for those services for those people. So, you know, it, I, I, I think, think it, I think there I are mean, I think there's, there are, there's an like issue you there. said, there, there's definitely two disparate issues here right there's there's the the obvious issue of there are companies who go around employment law by trying to use contractors for things that are in-house employee jobs and there are some federal laws regarding that there are a number of state laws in every state um 
and and yes, that is a problem. Sixty or seventy percent of the time, there's there is a legal solution to it. Um, but yes, that it's definitely a problem, and like you said, we've both seen it. Uh, the software industry has a lot of it. Um, the the online writing industry has a lot of it. We've both we've both seen that situation. But when it comes to when it comes to this kind of thing, you know, the idea that somebody could be sitting in their living room waiting for a for a ride to come in and go, ah, all right, eh, we'll go, and jump in the car and go pick somebody up, or or they're waiting for a task rabbit, right? There's no driving around with that one. You're just you're literally just sitting around waiting for somebody to say, "I would like you to do a thing," and you say, "Okay, I'll do a thing." That's not, a, as far as I I can see, that's not a a full time thing. Though I do think that that if somebody is literally making a full time living on it, perhaps having some sort of a a group. Um, medical plan and things like that absolutely makes sense. Uh, I, I definitely yeah, think there's a, that's the thing. Cause there are a lot of people doing that. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a middle ground here because Uber has, has a lot of buying power, right? I mean, they have, they have special agreements with, uh, two car companies where you can get a special, uh, lease price on a vehicle. If you are doing so much, uh, in Uber business uh, as a driver, you know they they've got buying power. They could absolutely put together a program for their for their top drivers, um, and then that, I think that would be a good middle ground that wouldn't make the business model obsolete, <laughs> but would reward the the full time drivers. Yeah, I, I just they, they need something because I think too many people think of this as like there are people who use it as just a part time gig. Mm -hmm. Let's do a little part time gig. And then there's a lot of people who this is their this is their full time job. Yeah. And, and I think that's what, you know, what people are being cognizant of when they advocate for, for this type of legislation. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, there is obviously a lot of pushback from all of the gig economy companies because this will essentially end their business model, um, which would be a huge problem if if uh, Uber and Lyft are anywhere near as petty as uh, as Google is. Uh, they might just leave the state entirely, like Google News did with uh, Spain. So it'll yeah, be. Yeah, I mean, it, it is quite possible, and that obviously would hurt hurt the state economy too, because there's a lot of money. That is coming from from Uber, mm -hmm. and, um, and both of those yeah, companies so. are headquartered in California. They would probably move their HQ out of the state if uh, if they stopped yeah. doing business there. So th this could be an interesting battle gearing up here. Uh, we we will see in the next couple weeks. I imagine where this heads. This week's Pilch Point with Avram Pilch is proudly powered by, by PureVPN. Uh, protect your browsing history and your browsing activity from the, uh, the prying eyes of your ISP and companies like Google and Facebook uh, by using a VPN like PureVPN. Uh, and you have the ability to uh, report that you're somewhere else. So if you're on vacation out of the country and you want to be able to watch your Hulu or Amazon shows that are only available in the United States, you can still do that. And right now, PureVPN is giving our viewers a deal at $2.88 for a two per month for a two year uh, service instead of $10.99 a month. Uh, it's a really great deal. And to get that deal, you can go to pilchpoint.live slash purevpn. Avram has got another show and tell for us this week. I am very excited because I yes. always love Avram show like and tells. Kindergarten, it's like kin kindergarten every week. Um, <laughs> so here I have the Sphero Mini Robot. Uh, Sphero Mini has been out for a while, but this is new. 
it is this this is new because this is part of the Sphero Mini Activity Kit. Yes, it's really small. If you're familiar with a regular Sphero, which I actually have one somewhere in this house, but not in this room, um, it's more like you know, say the size of my fist per se. And yeah. this is, you know, you can see much smaller. A golf uh, ball versus a baseball. Can, yeah, I think that's a good way to to, to frame it. So, um, what's neat about this is not just that you have the robot because you can you've been able to get these for fifty dollars for a while but the activity kit coming october 2nd is going to be 79.99 and what you get with that is you get a bunch of other pieces with it to make it really useful so here for example are a bunch of pieces that my son used to build a little little maze um and they're also like little it comes with little accessories like this bowling pin for it to knock down um and it also comes with these activity cards here. Uh, like here's one called Maze Ball. And it Awesome. It tells you to uh, it tells you to dry to create a maze and drive drive the ball around. Now, you might be asking, how is that this is what is the point of this? So first of all, this is not just a toy. Uh, it is a STEM learning toy. And, you know, the, at the most basic level, there's there's two apps. There's a Sphero Play app, which allows you to use this for mainly just for fun. You drive it. You can drive it around uh, either using an on-screen joystick or you can use uh, facial recognition to drive it, which is pretty cool. I'm having trouble getting the Bluetooth uh, running on my phone here to show it to you. Uh, for some reason, I think I may have to charge charge this up again. Maybe it's out of charge or something. My son is, I'm sorry to say, been playing with it all day. So, um, you know, this is the this is the app, but it's like not finding it at this moment. Uh, but what happens when you have it running is, you this lights up, and it rolls around the floor uh, because inside it's got it's got motors and it's supposed to open up. So I'll show you what it's like. You know, without the ball around it right so here it is um it does not have a lot in the way of sensors uh but it does roll around because it shifts its weight so and it has led lights that can light up uh different colors so what you do with it and by the way you can see here that you have to take it out of the box to charge it because it charges over micro usb um what you do is you can drive it with the app just straight like an on-screen joystick. You can use your face. You can use the accelerometer in it as a controller in games that are on the screen. So there's like a, a Galaga-like game where you like shoot things and you can like do it with your rolling around, you know, your, your Sphero to do that. Um, but what's really interesting is when you launch the EDU app and you can program it in a variety of different programming languages. So... They've got a block-based coding language that's really easy to use. And then I think you can also graduate to actually text-based code with these robots. And this is true not only of the Sphero Mini, but of the Sphero Bolt and the Sphero and, you know, the various other Sphero uh, ball robots that are out there. Uh, but this is a nice, a nice one because it comes with the activity cards and the pieces because just give somebody a ball and be like, okay, do something. Um, it's better to actually have an activity kit with specified activities to get your kid started. So, um, this is going to be seventy nine ninety nine when it comes out October 2nd. Uh, and I think it's going to be a good holiday gift for kids. Uh, my son really likes it. Uh, people, you know, when he shows, sh has shown his other sphere to people, they're really impressed. Uh, and this is a lot more affordable than the larger, uh, Sphero Bolt that costs about 125 and is the baseball size. And because it's small, it can, you know, you can create these mazes for it. Whereas the big one, you'd have to find some really big pieces. Uh, so here they're giving you uh, some activities to do with it. Um, now, what I'm curious to see is, and my son hasn't done it yet with this, is how easy is it to graduate to programming? One of the things that we have seen with the Sphero EDU app in the past is that. It is very, it is, there are aspects of the app that are very oriented towards school. So you'll go, 
into the app and it'll say download this lesson plan and obviously if you're at home you're not going to do that right you're you know that's for teachers yeah um but it's supposed to be for both home and and school uh so um you know i have to see yet i haven't tried this one this new activity kit with the with the edu app um but uh definitely like a lot of fun a very reasonable price of course you could get the ball just by itself for fifty dollars although i think the ones that they sell for fifty dollars are not clear like this they come in different colors kind of like the clear because then you can see the light through it and um see the motors and everything so um you know we'll have a full review up of this shortly on tom's hardware but i have to say uh it's looking pretty good um along with you know the other sphero products they definitely are are good gifts for kids with a with a learning uh stem angle to them and and one of the things that's really cool um about sphero is that um they work with a whole bunch of of uh organizations to put together third party integration uh like their their sdk is open um so there's a there's a dot net uh sdk so if you want if you're trying to learn c sharp and you already have been messing around with a sphero well you can learn to program in c sharp or vb um with the Sphero with the thing that you already know, because you've already programmed it using the, the block language. You understand yeah. how it works. You can then literally move right into the other languages, including uh, third parties that they have nothing to do with. So I, I've always, I've always liked that about them. I, uh, one of the first, uh, first hardware related programming that I ever did uh, in .NET was, was for the original, the original original uh sphero <laughs> a number of years ago what did you program it to do um i well it, it in the beginning it was just you know for those who may have used this it was like using the old carol programming language um so it was it was kind of like you know move forward three rotations turn 90 degrees to the left move two rotations you know uh, but then just for the, for the heck of it, uh, I started adding external sensors to, to keep track of it and make decisions based on it. And there's, there's so much, right. there's I so mean, much you can that, do. I think that's where it gets really interesting. I mean, one thing I, you know, if I were talking to them about future products, I wish that they would make, they would make a ball with more sensors in it mm -hmm. because that's where the programming gets really interesting when you can actually make make a robot do something based on external conditions. Yeah. And th this doesn't have a lot in the way of sensors. It has an accelerometer. I don't think it has IR. Um, so, you know, it would be great if you had one that had like light sensors and temperature sensors and, you know, facial recognition. I don't know how a ball would recognize your face, but um, now well, the app does, the app actually has that, which is pretty cool. You can, you can move it by staring at it. So there's a, I wish if I could connect, I could show you this. There's a thing in the app where if you smile, it moves forward. And if you frown, it moves backwards. Okay. That's crazy. Um, I love that. So, so that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. And that'll work with any Sphero that you have. So if you have another Sphero, that'll work too. But um, yeah, that, that was, that's kind of fun. We were playing with that yesterday. It's, it's like literally among the silliest things ever. And I absolutely love it. <laughs> I cannot wait to to do it now. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. So uh, uh, obviously uh, your son has been enjoying it, which uh, which bodes well for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's uh, he's my tester for these sorts of things. I see how he plays with them. I see how long he plays with them. Um, so, yeah, he. Uh, you know, he really likes Spiro. He liked the fact that this came with things to build. Um, so I, th and I think at the price point that it's at, you know, while not, not dirt cheap, um, it's a nice little activity kit to get somebody for a gift this holiday season. Sure. That makes sense. And 
And like you said, I really like the idea that it comes with essentially a packet of ideas. <laughs> because when yeah, you're just given you just the give ball, somebody the ball, like, just do something. You're going to drive it, and then you're going to stop, and then. I think that's the number one thing you really got to measure toys by in general, whether they're learning toys or not, is, is this kid going to play with this for more than an hour? Because if you're spending money on something that they're only going to play with like one time or for an hour or something, and that's it, that's a waste of money. So, you know, that's, I think that's, that's always the question for me with, uh, with toys is like, are you going to get, are you going to get more time out of it? Is it going to lead you to do other things? And, and interestingly, um, uh, when Sphero decided to stop doing licensed products, it was because of that. Um, they watched app usage, uh, for people who had purchased the licensed content, like the, the most famous of their licensed content, obviously being BB-8. the BB eight, because, they designed the BB-8 for Lucasfilm for the movies. Um, uh, that was used infrequently by everybody versus the regular ball, which had a significantly higher uh, percentage of people who used it on a more regular basis and did more things with it uh, in the app, which is why they decided not to do licensed content anymore. And my guess is why they put this, this uh, package together uh, so that they could give some great ideas on ways to use it to, so that people didn't feel like they had just bought a thing and used it for a little while and put it on a shelf and meh. So right. that's, exactly. that's really cool. Um, obviously you'll have a review coming, right? Yes, shortly. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to seeing that, uh, whenever you publish it and as always Avram, I look forward to seeing whatever it is uh, we're going to show off and talk about next This week's Extra Life on F5 Live is proudly powered by Razer. All the accessories you need to up your game on uh, PC and console are available from Razer. And right now, uh, Gears 5 is out, and so are a whole slew of accessories designed uh, to make you better at the game and to bring you more into the game with, uh, with licensed uh, products for both PC and for Xbox One. Uh, keyboards, mice, headsets, and a whole lot more. And all of that is available by going to f5live.tv slash Razor. So obviously we've been talking over the last couple of weeks a lot about the rise of game streaming. And I'm not talking about uh, playing a game and streaming it on Twitch. I'm talking about the other way. Uh, uh, Things like Project X Cloud from Microsoft, uh, Pro- uh, Stadia from Google, um, and there have been others. Obviously, On Live was kind of the the original of these, and it no longer exists. Um, PlayStation has PlayStation Now, uh, which was built on Gaikai. So it, this concept's been around for a while, but we've really seen a huge. Uh, focus on it in the last year or so and even more so just in the last couple of weeks and we have a new contender uh who is getting closer to bringing a product to market it is electronic arts uh we will leave aside the uh gamer concerns about ea and anything and we'll just talk about what happened this week uh ea announced that they were doing a technical test on Project Atlas, which is their game streaming platform. Um, It's running right now. We have a link at uh, plugkitslive.com where you can go and you can sign up. There is uh, no requirements to sign up except 
A, understanding that it is a technical test. It is not an alpha. It is not a beta. It is super early stage, and it will not always work. There will be glitches. There will be bugs. You will get mad. Know that. And two, uh, when you have played, they are going to want feedback because that's what they're doing. Um, but if you agree to those two terms, uh, you can go sign up right now and uh, help them out with their technical trial. And if you are playing one of the one of the games, FIFA 19, Need for Speed Rivals, Titanfall 2, or Unravel, um, and you have that game on PC, you can actually sync your uh, game state to Project Atlas and pick up your game where you left off, which I think is pretty cool. Um, this is this is different than what Google did, right? Google did their technical test, their public alpha, I think is technically what it was, uh, but they did their technical test with only one game. Um, whereas, whereas EA has decided let's do multiple games and multiple styles to, cause I think they're looking for, well, would a game with not as much constant input like FIFA 19 respond differently than a game with kind of constant input like Titanfall. Because the games are, you know, the input styles are different. You know, a, a driving game, for example, like Need for Speed Rivals, is going to require some pretty weird, <laughs> weird inputs versus, you know, again, a game like FIFA. I think they're I think they're trying to test across a wide variety, which seems like a good idea to me. Well, you know, lost in a lot of these conversations is Nvidia's effort GeForce Now, mm -hmm. which I'm in the uh, beta for and have been for a while. I think that thing has been in beta for years though. It's <laughs> it's been a long time. Right? Yeah. And it's it's almost it's and, been uh, in beta for so long that it almost feels like they bought the the assets from on live and just have had that in beta ever since. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe it's been around uh, so long. So, so, you know, I got you got to sign up and you don't know, automatically get get right. in. But uh, after a while, someone at NVIDIA uh like maybe six months ago or something, someone from NVIDIA emailed me and pressed like, hey, would you like to try it? Yeah, I wanted to try it. So uh, it inspired me because I was like, oh, great. I can now I can play some, some like PC games on my laptop with integrated graphics mm -hmm. that I couldn't play at all. So, you know, my son and I were, were sitting, you know, using it and we used it quite a bit. And it's it's a mixed bag. You know, uh, first of all, for some reason, it performs a lot worse if you have an NVIDIA Shield TV. So, like, NVIDIA makes their own, like, set-top box, a Shield TV, and that's supposed to have GeForce Now support built into it, and it does. But we were getting, like, kicked off of it much, much, much more. Interesting. And, like, problems with the connectivity that much, much, much more on the G... on shield tv than we on nvidia's hardware than we were under windows on on my pc that's interesting um but in both cases you know you weren't always you know sometimes it would say the server was too busy and you couldn't get on other times you'd have a lot of compression and it would get blurry um if you had a good connection i mean but good connection doesn't necessarily mean your internet connection at home might mean your connection to them at the moment is good mm -hmm. right um you you know the game the performance was good there and there was a pretty wide there's a pretty wide variety of games that geforce now supports i think there's like 500 games or something almost as far as i know almost all of them are on steam so you have to actually like log in and and log into your steam account there and the synchronization is an issue if something is already say like, I think there's some games that you can say Steam syncs your, your progress, but some games they don't. Right. So, like, we were really big into playing the Lego games, like, uh, like you know, like mm -hmm. the Lego Movie 2 game or whatever. And it would, if we logged into the GeForce Now account, it remembered our progress. However, if I then went to a gaming laptop, said, I'm not going to do this slow, this slow poker uh, GeForce Now thing, I'm just going to run it natively, 
It was a completely different save file, ah. and there was no way to synchronize them. And since it's and GeForce Now does not provide you with a way to copy files, so I couldn't like find wherever the save file is right. supposed to be and cop and copy it. So um, anyway, that's my long way of saying like I think this idea has a lot of uh, promise, and I um, but the capacity needs to be there. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, as a hardware guy, I'm not sure I want want these to be too successful because <laughs> if they worked really well then people wouldn't need you know wouldn't need computer wouldn't need good computers right um gaming has always pushed computer hardware you know much more so than probably any other industry in computing gaming has been has been the the performance pusher for decades so yeah if these are too successful we may not see the same kind of performance improvements on uh, on regular computers if uh, if they don't have that catalyst. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I don't I don't see it happening anytime soon, but there certainly is a lot of interest, and I can see why. Like, look, there's a lot of computers out there that are on integrated graphics, things like that. People want to play these good games, mm-hmm. and frankly, they're not used to spending they're not necessarily wanting to spend $2,000 to play the game of their choice right. when you could sign up for a cloud service to do it. Sure. Um, especially when you're competing against consoles where the cost of entry might be $200 to get yourself a PlayStation or an Xbox. Sure. Um, or, so, or even if you just look at the, uh, the, the patent that Microsoft filed for what is essentially an Xbox controller that holds a phone in it uh, and literally take Gears 5 with you. Let's, uh, let's just keep talking about that game. We've, <laughs> we've done yeah. it the whole show so far. Well, and then, uh, and you can and literally then if you take, had 5G... Yeah, exactly. You can literally take the game with you and play it out and about. Yeah. So, so if you had if you had five G and five G worked as advertised, uh, and you had good game streaming, yeah, then your phone would not actually need to be that powerful. Your mobile device would not have to be that powerful. Um, yep. So um, I can see why EA would get into this business. I think it makes perfect sense that a software publisher get into the business mm-hmm. uh, more, almost more so than. A somewhat independent third party like Google, uh, yeah. or Google, a Google has invested third party like Nvidia. Google has wanted to get into gaming for so long though, and they've never had an opportunity to break into a market that was pretty new. <laughs> this is their opportunity to do it. I don't know why they want to, but they've they they even had a prototype for a uh, console. Two or three years ago, <laughs> they've they've wanted to do this for so long, and they finally have an opportunity. But yeah, I it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense for EA. It makes sense for Microsoft. Um, you know they're they're trying to push Azure. They're trying to up the value of the Xbox brand. You can if you have the console, you'll be able to use an Xbox to stream the games itself without having to pay the service mm-hmm. fee. You know, there's all kinds of reasons for Microsoft to get into it. There's all kinds of reasons for EA to get into it. But uh, yeah, I'm with you. NVIDIA seems like a surprise. <laughs> they should be focusing on making the hardware that Microsoft and EA need to make it work better. Because <laughs> that's who they are. We know Everybody knows who they are. Be good at what you are. Uh-huh. And Google, uh, you never know why Google makes decisions. <laughs> well, they're trying to to get in on a hot thing. I mean, everybody gaming industry is is very profitable. Yeah, you're attracting people who are willing to spend money. Unless you're GameStop. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> that's you should have put that on the upstream. Closing uh, a whole bunch of I mean, stores. It wasn't it just. Yeah, wasn't that just this week? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, well, I think I after, think that's because the a, industry after shutting down ThinkGeek. 
Right. Well, see, that was their biggest mistake because ThinkGeek is probably the only part of that business that actually will continue to matter. Agreed. Um, it seemed backwards to me. I'd have put ThinkGeek up on the stores and put GameStop as a sub logo, like like GameStop used to be a yeah. sub logo on the parent company. I can't remember what it was called. It was right, a, right. Like I don't shop. know. I guess maybe they just weren't turning out a lot of money from ThinkGeek, but ThinkGeek was something that had original products and value and things that people actually. There's a future in people buying geeky souvenirs. Uh huh. There's not. Of much of a future in physical game sales right. and that's why and that's why GameStop is in trouble yeah uh, and because because the future is downloading da- and streaming and streaming yeah right and if you go into a GameStop it's today like Blockbuster video exactly you can't just because Blockbuster gave you a three day grace period to return your videos wasn't going to stop people from signing up for Netflix sorry <laughs> and and GameStop, right? right. That's the th- bringing bringing Funko Pops and stuff from ThinkGeek into into GameStop and turning a third of the store into a micro ThinkGeek. Not gonna save it, guys. Not gonna save it. Change the logos around. Put ThinkGeek on the outside. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, I mean, there actually were ThinkGeek actual stores. Mm-hmm. We have um, we have one here. We're only that. We have one here. Uh, the physical yeah. stores are the only thing that, that remained. Uh, yeah, I saw one in Syracuse the other day. I was in Syracuse for Labor Day, and they still they mm-hmm. still had one labeled Think Geek. I don't know how long it's going to stay. But. Uh, the company has said that they're going to keep the physical stores that are Think Geek branded. They were just shutting down the website mm-hmm. and bringing it into the GameStop brand, which I think is dumb. Anyway, uh, yeah, so GameStop yeah. is in trouble because of all of this kind of thing. With, with the rise of game streaming, the, the fact that, that downloadable content is so, so ubiquitous that Microsoft released an Xbox without um, an optical drive. <laughs> it, so, you know, the, the, the future is definitely digital, both download and stream. So uh, it'll definitely be interesting as more of these pop up because EA will not be the last. Uh, there's... There's no way that we don't see uh, a couple more uh, of the big players. Activision will get into this for sure. Uh, my guess is that E3 uh, 2020 is going to be big on streaming. This week's news from the tubes and F5 Live is probably powered by Rift Tracks. Make fun of movies or let these guys do it for you. Mike Nelson and Bill Corbett and Kevin Murphy, the former stars of Mystery Science Theater 3000, are back and doing what they do best, creating commentaries for Hollywood blockbusters and B-movie oddities such as Subspecies for The Awakening. Frightens me that there were three before that. Uh, the way it works is for a couple of dollars, you download the MP3, play it along with your DVD, Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, wherever the movie happens to live, and laugh. Um, they they also have uh, short films, which are industry insider films like What is a Map? Terrifying. And uh, school-type films. Uh, they also do what is called Rift Tracks Presents, where uh, some of their friends and uh, colleagues do riffs. Uh, Bridget and Mary Jo from uh, the older Mystery Science Theater 2000 do some of those, like Junior Prom. And all of the movies, both feature and short, are available by going to f5live.tv slash riff tracks with an X. All right. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and we've been asking the question, uh, what is the legality of scraping data from public, publicly facing websites? Well, uh, the, let's say it's the ninth, I don't remember what court it is. Yeah, it is the ninth circuit appeals court. Um, this week ruled that 
um, it was not illegal for a company called HiQ to scrape public facing data from LinkedIn. Um, it has been going on for a number of years in 2017, Microsoft slash LinkedIn sent a cease and desist letter to the company saying, uh, stop, no more of that. Um, and then the company said, nah, we don't think we will. And so <laughs> Microsoft slash LinkedIn, um, sued, uh, and claimed that they were violating the, um, the computer fraud and abuse act, which was probably their big mistake. Um, because that is a hacking law, which is not really what data scraping is. Um, but the end result is that a circuit court of appeals, which is the first time it's, it's gotten to this level, um, has said that it is not illegal to scrape data from a website. Now, what was not argued and what is not um, quite solid is what a website's uh, data usage policy can and cannot control. Uh, so in Instagram's case, we talked a couple of weeks ago about a company called Hyper that was um, scraping location data from Instagram. Uh their, act, their data usage policy specifically prohibits that. But does that hold up in a court of law? We don't know. Because across the country, there have been a number of these cases, and uh, the, the results have been <laughs> varied. Um, so this is the highest court to hear and rule on such a case. But it's... Uh, it's a circuit ap appeals court. It's not, you know, it's not like a federal appeals court or, you know, the Supreme Court. Uh, so it's not 100% standing, but we definitely have a bit of an answer to our question from a couple of weeks ago, Abram. Well, look, anything, my view is anything that a person could do, a computer should be able to do also. Right. So a person could go and view and an army of people could go to LinkedIn with a bunch of quill pens and start writing down all the information on a bunch of notebooks, you know, dip it in the little ink jar or whatever. And they could they could spell it all out. So all you're doing with a computer is what? a person or army of people could do if they had unlimited time and resources. So, you know, if a person could do it, a computer should be able to do it. A person could see that data. The data, they didn't have to pick a lock to get the data. The data is public. If a person could do it, could, could view it, then a computer should be able to view it also. And I think, so, so right now, the legal line is the definition of public, which essentially means that you don't have to log into a system to access it. You don't have to register. You don't have to log in. You don't have to be somebody's friend. You don't have to. So a public LinkedIn profile, uh, which means that you don't have to be logged in, can be scraped. A private or a behind a login uh, profile cannot. That is the current legal distinction. So Wikipedia, me. Wikipedia is fair game. Uh, um, uh, IMDB is fair game, but the IMDB stats are not because you have to be a, a pro subscriber. Essentially, you have to be in the industry to see that information. So that's that's kind of the because anything you put behind a login is usually the secret sauce of the platform. Right. Uh, so right. Uh, that makes sense to me. But yeah, if it's if it's 100% yeah. public, if I can go to a website and not have to log in, apparently that data is free reign. <laughs> I mean, did you ever see Star Trek The Next Generation? There was I remember seeing a couple episodes where Lieutenant Data is sitting there reading something and he's just like, doo, 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 and he like reads a whole book in uh -huh. like a few seconds. Well, if a person could do that, a, pe a person <laughs> could do that, uh, then, you know, a computer should be able to do it. It's just... Reading the book 
reading the website faster than a normal person would. Absolutely. So, uh, hooray, we have our answer, at least for now. <laughs> we know how court stuff works. If it goes above them, things may change. But for now, we have got our answer. This week's DRM Not Included on F5 Live is proudly powered by Amazon Prime. In addition to free shipping, which you already know about, you get a whole bunch more, including Amazon Prime Music, which gives you several million tracks available to stream for free, uh, and a huge discount if you want to upgrade to the full Amazon Music experience. You also get Amazon Prime Video, which gives you uh, TV, movies, documentaries, and more, both original content and licensed uh, available as part of your subscription and you get twitch prime which gives you um, one free subscription per month to support the content creator of your choice you can use that to subscribe to us at plug hits live or uh, any other content creator on twitch that you want to uh, you also get free games every month uh, i love that feature i use it all the time uh, and they change all the time so uh, definitely check that out and uh, you also right now at least for a little while longer. If you have a Nintendo Switch, you can get a free year of Switch Online as well. We've made things easy for you. We've got a page with links to all of these features, uh, and you can find that by going to f5live.tv slash prime. Um, we talk about streaming services all the time uh, because uh, there are a lot of them, and there's one that... <laughs> We never talk about because most people forget that it exists. And that is Vudu, uh, one of the early streaming services that was purchased by Walmart and um, at some point tried to allow you to sell your DVDs back to them to give you a digital version. It was weird. Um, they've turned into a more traditional streaming service since that bizarre mess. Um, and... In grand... I used them recently. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not like on purpose per se, but um, at uh, at work, somebody and it, they're not someone from Tom's Hardware. Someone, someone in some other part of Future PLC, our parent company, in our office, seems to be getting free copies of certain movies and TV shows. I saw that photo. The giveaway table that we have. Right. So the photo that I took and put on social media was of a pile of young Sheldon uh, Blu-rays that sat around not, for a while. Not, were not sat around for a while. However, what they did have, uh, what they, this, whoever this saintly person is who's getting these things, also <laughs> has gotten are little like pieces of paper with voodoo codes. Well, huh. they're actually like they're not voodoo codes. They're like what's it called, like play any, there's some other service that basically you type in the code and then it lets you put it in your, in a voodoo account. Okay. Um, yeah. The, and the, so for, they had, the former Disney watch anywhere that became something else. Right. So they've been getting apparently like piles of like five or 10 of these for certain movies. So like, so they had, they had out like Godzilla King of the monsters and I was like, Oh, I want to watch that. So, so like I had to create an account and then type it in and then put it, assign it to Vudu and that's how I watched it on, on my Xbox on my TV. So, uh, so I have used Vudu as recently as as last week. Um, okay. And it it seems fine at what it does. I mean you know, whatever. I don't think it's appreciably worse than renting a video from Amazon Prime or Google Play. Sure. Um, well, know, whatever. It's just nothing special. Well. That's about to change as Voodoo has launched a an interesting new feature called Family Play, which it's going to sound familiar here in just a moment, um, allows you to watch a movie sans questionable content. So maybe there's a film out there that you would love to watch with your family, but there's one scene in it that that just makes it not possible. Well, Family Play 
uh, will censor that content out of the movie for you so that you can watch the thing with your kids or whatever without having that questionable scene involved. If this sounds familiar, it's because it is. It is almost the same as a service called VidAngel that we talked about a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. There was a big difference there. VidAngel um, did not have the legal right to stream the videos and they stole them in the first place. So <laughs> VidAngel's legal troubles uh, were wide. But uh, that does not mean that uh, Voodoo and parent company Walmart are not in for a potential fight. Um, they will likely, like, um, like VidAngel tried to do, uh, argue that they fall within the Family Home Movie Act of 2005, which is part of the Family Entertainment and Copyright Act, which, quote, permits the development of technology to sanitize a potentially offensive DVD and video on demand content. So, likely, this will be perfectly legal, and there will be nothing that the um, that the studios will be able to do. Um, though the studios have always been uh, unhappy with this concept, there was a chain of <laughs> to go back to the blockbuster days because apparently that's a theme tonight um, in the. <laughs> In the uh, old video rental store days, there was a chain that used to do this uh, on VHS, and uh, the studios put an end to that real quick. Then there was VidAngel that the studios put an end to real quick, but they used a different thing. It'll be interesting to see what happens here. Um, I mean, Walmart has big power, right? So it's possible that they've already negotiated this, and it's no problem. Um, It's also possible that that this law will protect them and the studios won't even try. Um, or we might get to, to watch the exact same thing happen a third time. So, you know, it's really interesting. This came up, this came up uh, today because I had an experience today that made me kind of wish that, that, that I was able to filter okay. a movie. Now, keep in mind like as a parent, I see both sides of this, this issue, right? Sure. Like before I was a parent, I was like, Oh man, come on, give me a break. <laughs> this is how the artists want their movie to be seen. If they want to have a curse word in the movie, don't sanitize it. If they want to have, you know, a violent scene in the movie, don't sanitize it. If they want to have nudity in the movie, don't sanitize it, you know, but you know, Oh, just don't show your kids or just explain it to your kids. Well, now I'm here to tell you as a parent <laughs> why that doesn't necessarily work. Okay. So let's say, so let's say you want to watch your parent. You want to watch a movie. You, your kids go to sleep at a certain time. But you don't always get to do a lot of stuff after they go to bed. So you gotta, if you want to watch a movie, sometimes you got to watch it in their presence and hopefully, and you might even want to watch it with them. Mm-hmm. Right. And if the only thing in the movie, like, look, I'm not going to uh, want a bowdlerized version of, uh, I don't know, of like, um, Pulp Fiction. What was that? <laughs> no, well that too, but what was that? What was that movie? I'm trying to remember the name of the movie where the three guys go to Europe and they they think they're staying at this nice place, but they end up being tortured to death. Uh huh. Oh no, 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 one of the guys escapes. Yep. But, oh, I'm just wondering. Anyway, you know, you know the movie I'm talking about. What was it called? <laughs> um, Hostel. Hostel. Yeah. Hostel. Right. Look, I'm not going to show my son Saw. Like, <laughs> like I don't want somebody to take Saw and try and make it family friendly. Okay? Right. Okay. Because like that's a because we all far. yeah we but, all know what that movie is. It would be right. a it would be but, a ninety look, second movie if you, if you sanitized it. Okay, but 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 let me give you some really good examples of why it really would be used and where mm-hmm. it really would come in handy. So like we were watching Godzilla King of the Monsters mm-hmm. and like the very first scene they're using 
curse words. And they maybe use them like five times in the whole movie. Okay. Right. Now you might say like, oh, come on, let your kid hear it. Okay. Will you take the phone call from the school that I'm going to get when he uses it in school? Right. Like it, being a parent these days means that you're not just responsible to yourself. Right. But to the school or whoever else is going to call you. And like, I will get in trouble if my son goes to school and he teaches other kids bad, like oh, God. naughty words. It's not even, it's not right. even that like I mor- morally object to him using naughty words. I mean, I maybe, maybe not, but like I have to watch out because if he goes to school and he tells other kids that stuff, then I'm going to be in big trouble. Yeah. Like seriously. <laughs> right. So I want to watch the movie. It's not integral to the plot. Right. It's somebody who's burning toast curse about it. Right. Right. You know, uh, so like, I, I kind of even wish when they made the movie, they would have thought twice about some of these things. Like I get it. You're being artistic or whatever, but have some pity on, uh, have some pity on us parents here. Like, so if I were the studio, I mean, first of all, this is also not unprecedented. You're not talking, you're talking about extreme examples of somebody like VidAngel that were going like outside the lines they, here they to pi- do it. They pirated the videos in the first place. <laughs> Which. Right, right. I, they, right. they were yeah. off so, the chain. <laughs> you know, they were going, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm using the wrong, wrong, wrong phrase here. They were, they were going, they were doing something that was clearly like going to offend the studio. It's all right. But, how many times you've been on an airline and you watch the movie and it's been edited for content mm-hmm. or network television where mm-hmm. it's been edited for content or even basic cable where it's been edited for yeah. content. So the concept of editing the films for content is, is not new at all. Right. It's, it's, it's a long, very, it's, it's very a longstanding old. tradition. So the problem is that they don't usually do it on demand. It's usually like, Oh, this particular venue, be it an airline or, 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 or network television uh, has has these standards, so we'll make edit it for them. Right. Now, here's what I don't know, and maybe you know the answer. Who does the editing? Is it the broadcaster or is it the movie studio? It's usually the it's usually the publisher, the distributor. So, so maybe what should really be happening here is that these companies should be making like you know, versions, you know, toned down versions of their product. Now I get it. Like what you know, the artists who are like what Fox involved, did, they're not going to like it. Like what Fox did with, uh, they, they did that toned down version of, uh, of Deadpool and put right. it in the theater. Yeah. 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 I mean that's a that's a good that's a good example. Now they were kind of making fun of that, like little, it was, yeah. oh how could they do it, whatever. I mean they made I mean, fun of it. They made fun of it themselves because that's what Deadpool does. But <laughs> but yeah, you know a movie that was R had a PG thirteen theatrical release. I mean that's so the studios aren't terribly right. afraid to do it. I think I think their their problem will come in if they're not in charge of what is happening or if they're not asked for permission. Right. So Walmart being a big enough uh, company like this could actually be a good idea. It could be a good business for them. It's it's clearly a business that is wanted. If it wasn't, this would not be the at least the third time in my in my consciousness that it has happened um, publicly. I mean, there might have been smaller examples of it, but I remember when I was a kid, I distinctly remember the the uh the movie rental place chain getting in trouble I, it was big enough that there's a family guy joke about it um and then uh then vid angel and now this obviously it's something that's wanted it's just a matter of of making the right agreements with the right people to make it possible and this law might be the thing so you know we we may actually see this stick around for for the long haul and like you said there's a need for it there's a desire for it I don't have a problem with it. So long as everybody's on board, I don't have a problem with it. I just, I just want people to know, cause this was surprising to me. I didn't believe this until I became a parent 
I thought the parents who wanted this stuff were like really, really, <laughs> really conservative parents. Uh-huh. You know, like they're homeschooling their kids. Maybe mm. they, you know, they're very, very, you know, no, I'm telling you, I'm not, you know, like a lot of parents, not just people who are like super, super religious or super, super, you know, moral, send your kid to private religious school or something like, no, we get in trouble if our with the public school, if our kid comes in and starts cursing. So we got to like not have the like we've got to not have the curse words and and. We also don't want to have a talk about the birds and the bees with our seven year old. So like, you know, so like we don't. And a lot of times I'm sorry to say, like these things are not necessary to the plot. Right. You don't need to have to have nudity to have the plot. Right. You don't need to have, you know. So anyway, that's my that's my that's my that's my little rant. It's not just for. It's not it's not just for a small group of, yeah. of very concerned parents. It's it's for everybody who's a parent. Yeah, makes sense. Well, that is our show. Thank you to those of you who joined us live. If you uh, did not and would like to in the future, Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, F5 Live TV slash join us. Um, if you're not able to do that, you can always subscribe. Plug it's live dot com slash subscribe. There you'll see all our shows including F5 Live and the Pilch Point and a bunch more. And you can see all the different ways that you can subscribe from there. Um, as I said at the beginning, we are trying these uh, weekend throwback uh, streams on uh, Twitch and Mixer. So that same link, f5live.tv slash join us, uh, will bring you to that uh, during the weekends. We'll see how that goes and see if uh, we make the decision to keep doing it. But it was fun today, so we'll see what happens. Um, and I guess, uh, other than that, um, Roboticon in a month. Very excited about that. And uh, I think that's all we've got. <laughs> On behalf of the staff that's not here, I'm Scott. I'm Aram. And we will see you guys back next time. Ciao.